two months ago, an Israeli artist did a song called Refana, taken from this Torah portion. And again, Refana simply means to heal her. And of course, referring to healing uh, Miriam. So we're going to talk a little, bit about, a little bit about Miriam, what happened. Uh, I'll give a, a certain perspective on that whole narrative that's perhaps different, but I think it's, it's biblical. So let's talk about tonight's Torah portion. Beha Alotcha is the name of the Torah portion. It simply means when you set up. Now it's talking about the menorah. It's, it's, it's God commanding or directing Aaron, the sons of Aaron, the Kohanim, in regards to the setting up of the menorah. So this is how the Torah portion begins. Be'alot echa, when you set up. So, a lot there in the Torah portion has to do with the, the menorah, and we know the significance of the menorah, right? What's the most complete significance of the, of the menorah? It's a symbol of Messiah Jesus' ministry. It's perhaps the most vivid and clearest symbol of the ministry of Christ. And, and it's a wonderful symbol. I, I love the menorah just in fact, uh, this, early this morning I was up praying and doing what I do early in the morning. And there, there, was, a little, there was a little caption on Facebook showing four or five different uh, coins, ancient coins found in the Second Temple period with menorahs on it. And of course, the menorahs are all depictive of that menorah, which was the Second Temple style menorah. We don't know if the actual menorah that uh, Moses and the children of Israel built was exactly like that. We don't know. But we know that that was the style of the Second Temple menorah. How do we know that? For sure. Because of that arch in Rome. What's that arch called? Right? Titus's arch where they depict the Roman soldiers carrying off the menorah, and it's exactly like this. Now, there's some argument about what the actual menorah that Moses built actually looks like, but that's besides the point. So the menorah, a very important symbol in Israel, and it's a very imp important symbol to Christianity, and we as Christians should, re should, re should realize, recognize just how important the menorah is and lift it up as an important symbol. It certainly is. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the Torah portion. We're talking about Numbers chapter 8, 1 to 12, 16. All right, I want to abbreviate some of what I have here so I can run through this as quick as I can. All right, so Israel here is, is on a journey. This is, in fact, this Torah portion is when their journey begins. What journey is it? Well, the one that God had prepared for them for at least 400 years. It was with Abraham in Genesis chapter 15 where God spoke to Abraham and said, your descendants will go into slavery for 400 years, and in the fourth generation, when those 400 years are complete, I will bring them out because the sin of the Amorite is not yet ready or complete. So here now in tonight's Torah portion, Israel is being led out, being led out by God for this very purpose, to address the Amorite, to address the sin of the Amorite, to conquer the land of Israel and establish the kingdom in the land of Israel. This is God's plan for Israel. So Israel's on a journey. Let's read about it. Let's read about that journey. In Numbers chapter 10, I'm going to read 11 to 13, chapter 10, 11 to 13. Now in the second year, in the second month, on the 20th of the month, which is, what would be the second month? May? All right, the first month is March. That's Aviv, usually in March. So in the second month would be April or May, 20th of April, perhaps. Uh, let's get back to it. <laughs> At the 20th of the month, the cloud was lifted from over the tabernacle of the testimony. That signifies that God is preparing to leave. He's preparing to go, for, go forward. And the sons of Israel set out on their journey from the wilderness of Sinai. Then the cloud settled in the wilderness of Paran. So God lifted his presence, the, the glory of God, from the tabernacle that was at Sinai to Paran, which is about perhaps a day, a day or so journey. So they moved out uh, for the first time according to the commandment of the Lord through Moses. 
the standard of the camp of the sons of Judah according to the armies, and so on and so on and so on. So this is the big move. God is moving Israel out. He's bringing them into the land. He's preparing to establish his purpose, the purpose, the purpose for which he had planned for, for 400 years for Israel. This is very big to God. So here now we see in this portion as well that Israel is commanded to follow the cloud, to do exactly what God is doing. If God stops, if the angel of the Lord, the, the, the pillar of fire by, by night, pillar of cloud by day were to stop, it meant that God wanted them to stop. If it was to be lifted and, and if it began to move forward, they were to lift themselves and move forward as well. So here is a very clear picture of, Pastor Ken has taught us for many, many years, here's a very clear picture of walking in faith. Doing nothing unless you see God doing it first. Right? And so what did, what did Jesus, what did Yeshua Jesus say concerning this? I do nothing unless I see the Father first doing it. So this is, this is the reality of walking by faith. And so Israel here is a perfect picture of that, of that opportunity to follow God very closely. If he moves, we move. If he stops, we stop. This is, this is what God wanted from Israel. And, and by and large, they did it. But there were some hiccups along the way. Like I said last week, we're going to see Israel in a very negative light as we study through the book of uh, Numbers. We're going to see 13 times Israel will rebel against God. Very unfortunate. In other words, by the end of this journey that they're on now, they would have rebelled against God 13 times in tonight's Torah portion. We're going to see three rebellions, three of them, only in tonight's Torah portion. Very unfortunate. So this is very negative as it relates to Israel, but we ought to keep in mind that Israel chose that well, they didn't, they didn't choose that path for themselves, by not drawing near to God at Sinai, not allowing God to baptize them with his presence. What did Israel do at Sinai? They said, we don't know about that rumble, we don't know about the clouds, that, that hupa is too much for us to bear. Remember that Sinai was a what? A betrothal. God wanted to betroth Israel unto himself. That's what Shavuot is about. And Israel were to draw near to the mountain, not to come up the mountain, but to draw near to the mountain because God wanted to engage them. And what did they do? They decided to stay far off. What, what caused them to stay far off? Fear. Fear. Fear is never a good way to approach God. What is the way by which we ought to approach God? With conviction and faith, courage. It glorifies God when we approach him with, with courage. Uh, it, it really, really uh, de-glorifies God, if I can use that word, when we approach him in fear. It does nothing to enhance our relationship with him if we take a fearful position towards God. No, the Bible does say to fear God. Jesus himself said to fear God. But that fear is a fear of love. If you, Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. In other words, if you love me, obey me. Isn't that what Jesus said? Jesus said, the one who loves me, he it is that obeys me, and me and my Father will have fellowship with him. So if you don't obey God, you have reason to fear him. So fear him by, by being obedient to his word. So Israel struggled. They struggled quite a bit in this relationship with God, and they rebelled against him horribly. God himself would say uh, at uh, Kedesh Barnea, when they get to Kedesh Barnea, God himself would say, now you have rebelled against me now 12 times. And they would rebel, like, no, yeah, they would rebel against him yet again at Baal Peor. Now the key, the key for us to understand is that Israel paid for that rebellion. How did Israel, the nation of Israel, pay for that rebellion? Diaspora. Right? The 722 diaspora of the Assyrians, the 586 diaspora of the Babylonians, and the 7080 diaspora of the Romans. That was the end of it. Well, we are not in that place now. God has chastised Israel. He has given her double for her sins. According to Isaiah chapter 40, he's given her double for her sins. 
But he's now in a place where he's bringing them back and he's restoring them. He's raised up a people in the earth to say to Israel that God is no longer holding your transgressions against you. That's what, that's what he's doing today, folks. Did the prophets say anything about that? Ezekiel, Jeremiah, Isaiah. Did they say anything about a time when God would not hold the sins of Israel against them? They all did. Isaiah said it wonderfully. Comfort ye, comfort ye my people. Say to them that your warfare is ended, that God has given you double for your sins, and that your iniquity is now washed away. That's where we are today. Who is it? What body of people in the world do you think would be commissioned to say this thing to Israel? You think the Muslims will do it? You think perhaps the United Nations would do it? What about the Biden administration? Would they do it? No, it is for us, the church's position. We as Christians, we shouldn't be trying to force Jesus down their throats, right? No, we should be affirming to them that God has removed your guilt and he's now in the position of establishing you, Israel, as his holy nation. We live in that time. Now, we're seeing here in the book of Numbers, particularly, the rebellion of Israel, and it's ugly. Now, what I would like for us to do over the next four or five Torah portions is I would like for you to consider what's at work in Israel, the spirit, the attitude, the spirit that's at work in Israel, and ask yourselves, is there any of that stuff in me? Now, it's fair for me to, to encourage you to do this because I know what works in me. The very same spirit of rebellion that worked in Israel works in me as well. It works in each of us. Our challenge is to overcome. Israel did not overcome it. No, she didn't. But our challenge is to overcome it. So let's, let's read about these rebellions. Not good. First of all, there is the story of Yethro. Who is Yethro? You know him as Jethro. <laughs> Yethro. His actual name was Hobab. I'm not sure if you know this. His actual name was Hobab. In tonight's Torah portion, he's introduced as Hobab. What does the word Hobab mean? Beloved. Or, or loved. Hobab. Loved. Now, how did he become Yethro? Well, the story does go back to Exodus chapter 18, which I'm not going to get into. He became Yethro because the word Yethro in Hebrew means to remain. You see, Moses admonished he basically begged uh, Hobab to stay with the children of Israel, to go with them. Now, it's in, it's in the same Torah portion tonight, Numbers chapter 10, 29 to 32. Read it on your own. The story is that Moses really strongly encouraged Hobab, Yethro, to come with them because he knew the wilderness, he knew the desert. Why? Because Hobab was a Midianite. The Midianite were the sons of they were sons of Abraham, but they were the sons of Ishmael. They were Ishmaelites, and they, knew, they, they were people of the wilderness. They were the people of Saudi Arabia. So today's Saudi Arabians are Midianites, by and large, with some other mixes of people in there. So Hobab, or Yethro, was a Midianite. And Moses, he was also Moses' father-in-law at one point, uh, Moses married his daughter, right, Zephora. So he, he really strongly encouraged Hobab to go with him. Hobab said, no, I'm going to go back to my people. And Moses says, please, come with us. You know the wilderness better than we do. So tell me, is this something, is this something awry with Moses? What's wrong with Moses strongly encouraging Hobab to go with him? He's not wholly trusting in God. It's as if God did not say that I would lead you through the wilderness. I hope Moses here is, is sort of dependent on Hobab. So Hobab or Yethro did not go. Now Hobab or Yethro was a high priest to the God of Israel, to the one true God among the Midianites. So what do you think the chances are that Hobab or Yethro heard from God that he should not go along with Moses? What do you think the chances are? Probably very good. No, I think if Hobab or Yethro had gone with the children of Israel, he would have been elevated. 
And only one is to be elevated in the midst of Israel, and that one is the God of Israel. So let's talk about the most unfortunate rebellion that we'll see in tonight's Torah portion, three of them. The first two deals with complaining. <laughs> Actually, all three of them are about complaining, but the first two is complaining or complaints that came from the people of Israel. The last one, the third one, is a complaint that came from primarily Miriam, but her brother Aaron stood with him. Let's talk about these complaints. So, what do we know about complaining? <laughs> is there legitimacy to a complaint? Or can there be legitimacy to a complaint? Of course. Absolutely. Absolutely. If you're dealing with a human agency or human agent, complain. What about if you're dealing with God? What, what, what do we, how do we feel about that? You can, you can complain to God. It's not going to do much for you. Uh, it's not going to serve you well, perhaps. But so, so if you have a complaint against something I'm doing, you should bring that complaint to me. Right? But do it in a proper manner. Don't go across the street and join with someone else from the congregation and start complaining. What's the proper way to handle it? To go directly to the person that you have a complaint with. So I always say this to folks, whenever someone comes around and there's a complaint about someone or myself or whoever, I say, I say well, remember what Jesus said. If there's an offense between you and someone, a, a reason for complaint, you go to them directly. Don't come to me or don't share it with 20 people or even two people. Go directly to that person and share it with that person. It's the proper way to do it. So, but Israel is complaining, and their complaint is not being handled well. They're sort of complaining on the fly as they go along. They begin, they begin to grumble about things. So let's read about these complaints. They're not pleasant, but we'll read about them. The first one we see in uh, Numbers chapter 11, 1 to 3. Now, Numbers chapter 10 and 9 is about Israel literally embarking upon this great journey that God had prepared them for for 400 years. He had prepared them for this journey. Literally, they're just embarking upon the journey, and instantly, the people complain. Didn't take long. Instantly, they begin to complain. Uh, chapter 11, 1 to 3. <clears throat> now, the people became like those who complain of adversity. So there was some adversity. Now, do you suppose that there was a, a legitimate reason for adversity? I mean, over two million people in the wilderness being led by a pillar of cloud? Uh, yeah, I would say if you look at it from a very naturalistic point of view, yeah, there's all sorts of reason for complaining. But what had the children of Israel seen to this point relative to the God of Israel? that he was able to do wonders in the wilderness. They wouldn't trust him, right? So the people came, became as those who complain about adversity in the hearing of the Lord. And when the Lord heard it, his anger kindled, and the fire of the Lord burnt among them and consumed some of the outskirts of the camp. Not a pleasant thing. So generally, we don't like to think of God in this way, do we? We want to think of God as very, very benevolent, very gentle, not a God of wrath. But here he's kindling his wrath, and a fire breaks out in the camp. This, this goes back to what I've said many, many times. To whom much is given, much is required. Israel, chosen among all the nations to be an amsegula, a peculiar people. Therefore, they're responsible for more. And whenever they, they, they miss the... They, whenever they, they sin and miss the mark, the repercussions are great. And that's true for all of us, in Messiah particularly. To whom much is given, much is required. All right, so the people therefore cried out to Moses, and Moses prayed to the Lord, and the fire died out. The people therefore cried, okay, so the name of that place was called Terabah. Terabah meaning uh, Terabin, which is a burning a burning. Uh, oak, a burning piece of wood, terabin, terabah, meaning that the place burnt, because the fire of the Lord burnt among them. So Moses cries out. Now here you're beginning to see clearly the messiahship of Moses. 
What I mean by that is he is interceding on behalf of the people. The people transgress. He is quick to intercede on behalf of them. That's sort of the function of Messiah, intermediator between God and man or God and Israel. So that's rebellion. I, I, the journey just began, and suddenly the folks on the outskirts of the camp who felt perhaps like, hey, we're on the outskirts, we don't feel particularly safe or something, they began to grumble, and God brought fire against them. Hmm. Then we have almost immediately, almost immediately, another rebellion. I told you it wasn't pretty. It's not pretty at all. And this, this rebellion, the second rebellion, has to do with food. Now, we know we can get pretty carnal about food, right? We know that very well. If there's a, if, if there's a shortage of food or our, our regular diet is threatened, what happens? We kind of lo we, we lose it, right? It becomes, a, it becomes a huge concern if our diets are being interfered with. So here is Israel now. What's Israel facing? Forty years in the wilderness with manna. That's what they're facing. They haven't even began the journey, and they're grumbling about the manna. Think about it. Now, again, now from a purely naturalistic point of view, I guess you can say they have every reason to grumble. Forty years of eating manna. Can't he just throw in some, 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 some meat or something? You know, why manna? Okay, but remember what's, what's happening here. God is sovereignly providing for Israel. He's also painting a very important picture because the manna is a picture of whom? Of the bread of life that comes down from heaven. Jesus is the manna. And he's painting a very important picture for Israel. Uh, of course, they didn't see that, didn't care for it much, and they grumble against the manna. Let's read about it. Chapter 11, verse 4. I'm going to read 4. To nine. <clears throat> the rabble who were among them had greedy desires, their flesh, their gre greedy desires. And also the sons of Israel wept again, again, and said, Who will give us meat to eat? They're grumbling about the manna. You see, it's, it's, a, it's a tendency of ours to not be satisfied with what God provides. We're like children. When our, when our parents provide something for us, we always feel like they can do better. Can you relate? Do better for me. I need more. Uh, you know, you gave me these toys. Well, I love these toys, but what if I had more toys? And so it's a tendency for, of ours to not be satisfied with what God provides. Now, that also relates to us in Christ, in Messiah. It does. Because many, many times we do this, and sometimes inadvertently, we complain about what God has provided in Christ. We do. Now, I'm not going to elaborate on that because I think most of us, all of us, should understand my point. We do complain about what God has provided. Because we're unsatisfied. We're, as fallen human beings, we are generally unsatisfied. It takes a crucified determination. It takes a crucified life to say, God, what you have provided for me in Christ and Messiah Jesus is enough. In fact, it's all that I need. Because we're, we're always looking for more. It's true. So, so that's the problem, right? Uh, God's provided manna for Israel, something that will sustain them, provide all of the nutrients that they can possibly need, that will give them strength, protein, all of the antioxidants, everything they need is in the manna. God knows what he's doing. They were just to trust the plan. Their purpose was to simply trust the plan. But they couldn't. And they're grumbling about not having meat to eat. We remember the fish. Oh, the fish. I've got to be honest with you. If you tell me there's not going to be fish for 40 years, I might grumble a little bit. We remember the fish which we used to eat in Egypt. <laughs> what was happening to the people of Israel in Egypt? Bondage. But they remember the fish. And the cucumbers and the melons and the leeks, the onions and the garlic. <laughs> we know where their minds are. But now our appetite is gone. There is nothing at all to look at except manna. <laughs> My. 
Now the manna was like coriander seed, its appearance like that of berlium. Berlium is a, like a, a sap. It's, it's sort of a topaz in color. It was, like, it, it was like a coriander seed. It was a seed. So, you know, we've all seen uh, the Ten Commandments, right? Many, many times. How was the manna represented in the Ten Commandments? Little fluffy things that came down from heaven. And the daughters of Israel, they had their baskets and they were like, yeah, storing up their manna like little cotton balls. Well, the manna was actually seeds that appeared on the ground, like coriander seeds. Uh, the burial in color, meaning it was like topaz in color, yellowish gold color. Now, what were they supposed to do with the seeds? Grind the seeds. <laughs> it, wasn't, it wasn't hand to mouth. They had to grind the seeds into a paste, knead it like dough, and bake it into a cake. And they had to do that how often? How many days a week? Six days a week. God will provide twice as much on the Shabbat so that they won't have to do it on the Shabbat. So six days a week, God is expecting the children of Israel to go out and gather up off the ground the, 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 the manna, the seeds. Grind them into a paste, make a dough, and make cakes and eat that. That's God's sustenance. You know, quite often, what God provides for us, his sustenance, we look at it in the very same way. We, oh, here we go again. You know, I'm off to church again. Maybe the preacher will do something and, and make me feel good about myself, but we know he wouldn't. <laughs> That's just the way he is. And, and so why do I have to go through this again? Uh, or I'm going to service this, this, this tonight, today, I'm going to service. They're going to do the same thing that they do every time. It's going to be long. They're going to sing a bunch of songs. Ah. <sighs> Why can't I just go to a mega church where they do three songs? Some guy comes out and makes me feel good about myself and I can go home. So it's, it's natural for us to, to grumble about what God provides because we feel like God can always do better. Yet what he provides is exactly what we need. He's appointed you for the provision in your life. We just have to trust him like Israel we're supposed to trust him. All right, so this was rebellion. What did God do in response to this rebellion? What did he do? He sent an abundance of meat. The very thing they, con they, they complained about. He didn't send them cucumbers and melons and leeks and onions and garlics, but he sent them quails. And they ate the quails, and they gathered up the quails. And what happened as they began to eat the quails? It's actually a very sad story. Many, a plague broke out in the camp of Israel. Many died, and they were all buried in that same spot. Wherever they ate the quails, they, they died. God broke out among the people for their greediness and their unsatisfaction. Is there a word there? Dissatisfaction. Dissatisfaction. They were not satisfied with what he had provided for them. They wanted more. That's the human tendency. Give me more. Give me better. When what God provides for us is everything we need. And so God had to respond to Israel. Now let's look at the last occasion here of rebellion in tonight's Torah portion. There are going to be many cases of rebellion again. Now, this one has to do with Miriam, the sister of Moses, and Aaron, the brother of Moses. What happened? I'm going to present this to you as a possibility. Now, I'm pretty sure of this, but it's a possibility for you. It's subjective. You don't have to believe what I'm about to tell you, but consider it. First of all, Moses married a Midianite, right? Who are the Midianites? They're sons, of, sons and daughters of Abraham through Ishmael. They are the very people of Saudi Arabia today in terms of their demographic, their appearance, and everything else. So Zephora was a Midianite, the wife of Moses. Uh, she had two sons from Moses. And what happened on the way back to Egypt? What happened when Moses 
was with his wife, Zephyrah, the two sons, Goshan and... What's the other son's name? Goshan, Goshan and Malon? Malon? Yeah, someone can research that for me. So he's on the way back to Egypt, where he came from. He's going into Egypt to redeem Israel, to be the redeemer, the picture of Messiah, with his wife, with his two sons. And what happens? Something happens along the way. God decides that, well, Moses, you're not circumcising your two sons. You are going to be the redeemer of Israel. Your sons need to be circumcised. There is no way you can set the example as the redeemer of Israel if your sons are not circumcised. Apparently, and this is, you have to read into the story, but it's very clear, Zephyrah did not want her sons circumcised. And there was tension. There was pressure between Moses and Zephyrah. Finally, the tension built to a climactic point. God says, Moses, I'm going to kill you. I'm going to remove you from this mission. And Moses probably at that time said to Zephyrah, you've got to do this. We've got to circumcise the boys. She grabbed a flint stone and she did it herself and threw the four skins at Moses and says, you are a husband of bloodshed to me. Do you suppose that Zephyrah continued with Moses at that point? I say that she didn't. She turned around and went back to Midia. Moses married a Cushite woman. Sometime, sometime following that. He married a Cushite woman. There's a great difference between the Cushites and the Midianites. You know who the Cushites are. African, Ethiopian, uh, probably Ethiopian. So Moses, all of a sudden here in chapter 12 of Numbers, he's, he's married a Cushite woman. This is not Zephyrah. So the point is, Moses took another wife. Zephyrah said, you're a, you're, you're a husband of bloodshed to me. Here are the four skins that you so desperately want. I'm going back. And so now, let's, with that in mind, let's pick it up in chapter 12. We're going to read uh, 12, 1 to 3, maybe. Um, We'll see. So, then Miriam and Aram spoke against Moses. Now, I said this is rebellion against God, right? But they're speaking against Moses. We'll get back to that. Because of the Cushite woman who he had married, for he had married a Cushite woman. This is not Zephyrah. This is not the Midianite. This is, a, this is an African woman. And they said, has the Lord indeed spoken only through Moses? Has he not spoken through us as well? And the Lord heard it. What, what, what happens following this? God became wrathful with Miriam and Aaron because they were speaking out against Moses. Let's see, verse 4. Suddenly the Lord said to Moses and Aaron and to Miriam, you three come out of the tent of meeting. So the three of them came out. Then the Lord came down in a pillar of cloud and stood at the doorway of the tent, and he called to Aaron and Miriam. When they had both come forward, he said, now this is God himself now. <laughs> this is not Moses speaking as a prophet. This is God himself. He called out Moses, Miriam, and Aaron. And then he addressed Miriam and Aaron. Hear now my words. If there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, shall make myself known to him in a vision. I shall speak with him in a dream, not so with my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my household. With him I speak mouth to mouth, even openly, and not in dark sayings. And he beholds the form of the Lord. Why then are you, af uh, why then are you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? We know what happens next, right? What happens next? Miriam becomes leprous. So, not Aaron, but Miriam. What does that tell us? That this initiative was Miriam's initiative. She drove this, this issue. Now, what's the problem with Miriam and the, and the African woman? Why all of a sudden she's against Moses, saying God is with us too? <laughs> we're, just, we're like Moses here. What happened? What, what's the dynamic? What took place? 
jealousy, perhaps some racism. Perhaps, perhaps there was a little racism working in, in uh, Miriam. Perhaps for sure. Because it states it there very clearly that she was a Cush, because she was a Cushite woman. So from, 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 Moses's, from Moses's perspective, she's a woman. I don't care if she's a Cushite. She's my wife. From Miriam's position, from her perspective, Moses, you've diminished before me because of your marriage to that Cushite woman. So suddenly I am just as equal as you are because you diminished yourself when you married the Cushite woman. God is particularly upset about this. Particularly upset. So what does that tell us about racism? God has no warm feelings about racism. No warm feelings about racism. <laughs> Whose phone's going off there? <laughs> so, God responds to the racist attack that Miriam launched, launched against Moses because of, the, because of his wife. Now, the attack is against Moses, but it's against God. Why is it against God? Because God's anointed was attacked by Miriam. Miriam, who should have known better, had to be punished. And she was punished. She became leprous. And the very person she spoke against came forward to pray for her. Rafana. That's where the, the, the song Rafana comes from. Heal her is what Moses said. And that, we find that in the same chapter. Uh, verse 13 of chapter 12. Moses cried out to the Lord saying, Raphana, O God, heal her, I pray. Heal her. And God heals Miriam. Again, in that picture, God is lifting up the office of Christ, the office of Messiah, which Moses stood in, the intermediator between God and the people of Israel. So God exhibits his faithfulness to Israel, to, to Moses. That even though the rebellion was strong against him, Moses cried out to God on behalf, of, on behalf of Miriam, and God answered. Now, later on in, in, the, in the story of, of the book of Numbers, we're going to see, uh, we're going to see Moses' rebellion. Moses himself will rebel against God, and God would call him a rebel. God will tell him that you've rebelled against me. So, so even Moses, susceptible to being a rebel. And what's the point to all of this? The point is, we should trust the plan. We should trust God's plan. It's, it's, it goes back to that statement that we have in the military where it says, trust the plan. What's the essence of that statement, trust the plan? It says to the, to the soldiers on the ground, you may not know where we're going and why we're going. You may not understand exactly why we're going from point A to point B in the manner that we're going, but you don't need to know. Just trust that the commander has a plan. You see, this is where Israel was, and this is what Israel should have done. Simply trust God. The pillar of fire by night, pillar of cloud by day, wherever it went, you go. It was the pillar of fire by night, the pillar of cloud by day, that protected Israel from Egypt. So they should have been able to trust God and trust his plan. But they couldn't. Even Moses, in one instant, couldn't trust the plan and rebelled against God. So for us, what should we take away from this? Trust God's plan. Know what God's plan is for your lives. Know what it is. Identify what it is that God's doing in your life. And adhere to it. Trust it. Be honest about what he's doing. Don't superimpose upon God your wishes for your life. That's a mistake. That's a typical mistake that we all make. We, we all want to say, well, this is what God's going to do with me, or this is what God's going to do with me. I know it because I want it. If I want it, it's what God has for me. Is that tendency real, uh, Rosie? 
It's 100% real. We have to learn to, to, to put that aside and say, God, I want thus and so, but you may want something entirely different for me, and I am open for it. That's where I was 30 years ago. What I wanted wasn't what I have. But God led me in this way, so I'm trusting the plan. I'm trusting him as I go forward. And we all have to do the same. Trust him. If God has been gracious to you and he's allowed you to know what the plan is, what his plan is for your life, trust it. Trust it only. Trust in nothing else. We know where our help comes from. Our help comes from Esa Enai. Comes from the Lord, maker of heaven and earth. Trust him only. Now, I'm going to close with this. We know that there, in this country and around the world in general, there's much, much cause for concern over all sorts of things. I mean, you, you, can, you can list 20 things that we should be really, really concerned about, right? And we have every reason to be concerned. Politically, economically, uh, in every arena, we have every reason to be really concerned. But should we be concerned? Should I be concerned? If I am bent out of shape about anything, be it political, uh, fiscal, or any issue, even my health, then I'm not trusting the plan, am I? I'm, I'm not trusting the plan. We have to trust God fully, wholly. And not just give him lip service in that regard. It's easy to say, oh, I trust God. Easy to say, I'm trusting God, hallelujah. You know, sometimes I say, I, some, some, someone will say something to me, I say, praise God. And they say, I do. Okay, but praise him anyway. Trust God's plan. Don't go to the left or the right. If, he, if this is what he's doing, walk in it. Proclaim it and walk in it. So, Israel, we're going to see again over the next three or four Shabbat uh, portions, we're going to see the rebellion of Israel. It's stark. It's in your face. It's ugly. It's going to help us to recognize what works in us. It's going to help me to recognize what works in me if I were to just allow myself to get away with myself. It all comes back to the self, doesn't it? That's, that's where all of this originates from, the ego, the self. So this is going to be a good lesson on the ego, uh, being egocentric or being theocentric, God-centered or, or, or self-centered. I talked about the worship earlier here in this place, and the worship here is very theocentric. It centers on God and what God is doing. And every now and again, there would be an opportunity for someone to elevate, and I would have to come and shut them down. You know what I mean. Someone will try to capture the worship in some form, and I, myself, and maybe the elders would have to come along and put it down, because this approach must only be theocentric, only, rigidly centered on God. So trust the plan. I, I, I said this a few months ago. I'm back here again. Trust God's plan, not man's plan. What does God do with man's plan? He laughs. So, Shabbat Shalom.